All right, hey everybody. Can we just get a quick uh, thumbs up or thumbs down in the chat if you can hear me? I know we've been having some issues with the microphone, but just let me know. Give me a thumbs up if you could hear me, and then we will get started in just a moment. All right, it looks like we are good. So let's go ahead and kick things off here. Okay, welcome everybody to Walks and Wall Street. Today is October 29th, 2023. It is about 8.52 p.m. here in New York City and we are reporting from a very, very nasty and cold and windy and raw and just really, really horrible New York City weather. Now, I will say something before we get, get into the financial topics. This is pretty much par for the course for New York City, right? In New York in general. We've all heard that very famous sort of like meme or saying in New York City. You know, one day it could be summer and 80 degrees and the next day it could be absolutely freezing and 50 degrees. That's quite literally what happened. So yesterday it was gorgeous. It was about 80 degrees in Central Park, 77 to 80 degrees. It was quite hot. It was beautiful, beautiful weather. And today is just the exact opposite. It is horrible. It is cold. It is nasty. And uh, yeah, it's not going to be too fun to walk around in it tonight, but we got to get the jobs done. So let's move along here and check out futures. So futures just opened and looks to be about flat. The S&P 500 E-mini futures contract, ticker symbol ES, just opened up about 14 points. The ES is trading at $4,152. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ 100, the very tech-heavy NASDAQ. We also opened up about 68 points, trading at 14332 and last but not least, the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the Dow 30 E-mini futures contract, ticker symbol YM, opening up about 65 points, trading at 32,570. Now, if you remember from the newsletter I sent out to everybody, this market has been deteriorating quite harshly over the last couple weeks. We are pretty much oversold on every single technical indicator here. We've had massive amounts of money coming out of the stock market. The percentage of companies in the S&P 500 that are trading above their 200-day moving average is only about 27% of companies. Okay, And usually when we see this metric, that can signal all, all but a temporary bottom. Right. So what I would be looking for this week uh, assuming no major you know, additional geopolitical risk or anything crazy happens, it is possible we experience some extreme volatility either this week or next week, and maybe even a rally right back to the 50-day moving average. So uh, we'll just sort of keep tabs on that. I do want to check in on commodities as well as crude oil specifically. Uh, crude oil has opened down about 68 cents. We're trading at $84 a barrel. Um, you know, I think this is probably where we're going to trade. There's a lot of market analysts and commentators. They believe we're going back to $100 a barrel and over uh, by Christmas. I do not see that, uh, but we'll keep tabs on that. Once again, crude oil is trading at $84 a barrel as of doing this video. We'll quickly review something, everybody. Last week was an extremely, extremely busy week on Wall Street, particularly because we had the vast majority of that magnificent seven reporting earnings. These are all of the major tech companies on Wall Street. Pretty much all of them have reported except for two. Okay, so next week we are looking forward to probably the most anticipated company during earnings season, Apple. Tim Cook's company is going to report on Thursday, November 2nd, and Apple's quarterly results uh, is pretty much going to complete. Well, I think NVIDIA is actually going to uh, report on the 21st. So it's the second to last company in the Magnificent Seven that is going to be reporting earnings. This is going to be a make or break, and we've explained why before. 
Apple right now. I, I you know what? Since I'm at my computer, I'm gonna drop a link here for you guys. It's gonna be very helpful. Now, if you don't want to wait for that link, just go to the website called slickcharts.com. Okay, the comp uh, the URL is slickcharts.com and it is a very useful resource for everybody to look at the S&P 500 market capitalization by weighting. So I just dropped it in the in the link in the description. That's actually the newsletter, but if you scroll down in the newsletter, uh, I put a link to slickcharts.com and a visual of all the companies by market cap that make up the S&P 500. So the reason why this is important, right, is because Apple makes up about 7% of the entire index. So if Apple on Thursday, they bomb earnings, they come in with horrible results, they miss on the top and the bottom line, and the stock is down 10% after hours, for example, that's going to put a lot of pressure on the S&P 500 because it makes up such a massive portion of the entire market cap. Now, aside from earnings this week, what I think is going to be even more important than Apple's earnings and some of the other companies that are reporting is we are going to get a clear update on the course of monetary policy here in the United States. And that comes on November 1st, which is a Wednesday. So kind of crazy. October has come and gone. And by Wednesday of this week, we are going to be in November, only two months left of the, uh, left of the year. And then we are in Q1 of 2024. But the most important thing, if you could take one thing away from this entire live stream tonight, it is this. Wednesday is the conclusion of the FOMC meeting, the Federal Open Market Committee meeting. And we will know if the Fed chair is going to keep interest rates unchanged, if they are going to increase interest rates, or they are going to cut interest rates. We are going to have an update on monetary policy, and that will come on Wednesday. So exchange volume is probably going to be quite muted on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. The majority of the volume throughout the trading week is going to happen post FOMC meeting. Now, if you look at the bond market, there's almost 100% certainty that the Federal Reserve is going to pause on Wednesday, meaning they are not going to make a decision to increase the federal funds rate. However, if you were to ask me, I believe there is a very high likelihood that we get at least one more interest rate hike before the end of the year. We have two opportunities to do that, one of which is coming on Wednesday. The second opportunity is going to come in December. So we have two more FOMC meetings before the end of the year. And if you, know, you had to ask me, I think by the end of the year, we are going to have a Fed funds rate of between five and a half to five and three quarters of a percentage point. I don't think we're going to get a rate hike on Wednesday, but I do think we are 100% going to get a rate hike in December. Could I be wrong? Absolutely. Uh, but look at all of the economic indicators that have been coming in. Two weeks ago, we got the CPI data, right? It came in hotter than expected. 3.7% CPI in the United States. Another thing we're going to get is the jobs numbers, right? The Bureau of Labor Statistics is going to release the jobs opening and labor turnover survey for September on the same day as the FOMC meeting. So all of these things that are going to be coming into play is extremely important as it relates to the future of monetary policy in America. All right. So one more announcement before we get started here. Um, we have now completely updated our Behind the Street newsletter. So if you like all of the topics that we talk about each and every night on the live stream, that includes the U.S. equity market, fixed income, we talk about central banking, monetary policy, and the like, scan the QR code on your screen and you can punch in your email and you will be signed up to receive our Behind the Street newsletter. It is all of our free resource, uh, res uh, research, excuse me, it's freezing, I'm shivering, uh, will be emailed right to you guys. And if you don't want to read it, what you can do is you can now listen to it. I have recorded my voice in a podcast version on the Substack for our commuters. If you're driving to work, if you're taking the train to work, you could pop in some earphones, click the play button, 
And you can listen to the Behind the Street newsletter in podcast format if you scan the QR code or type exclamation point news, N-E-W-S, in the chat. Once again, exclamation point N-E-W-S in the chat. Uh, And you could sign up for that for free. Two days ago, I emailed it to everybody, so check your email box. Uh, And lastly, before we get started, I just want to say thank you, because we have grown by almost 600 people uh, on the newsletter since we put out our last two posts. Um, And it was, quite briefly, one of the top business trending newsletters on Substack for a very, very short time, and we have a very small audience. So that is mind-blowing to me. So thank you all for supporting my work, reading my research, uh, and we will uh, go ahead and get started here. So let me go ahead and close up the laptop. I will say hello to everybody in the chat. I'll open up the umbrella, and we are going to be walking to 34th Street tonight. You guys aren't going to believe this. You guys are not going to believe this. So I was walking back to Penn Station last night, and you know what I see? You know what I see right at Macy's at Herald Square? They are already starting to put up all of the Christmas decorations at Macy's. And we are going to check them out tonight. So one moment and we will get started. All right, let me clip the microphone on. I'll get my umbrella out because it is raining quite substantially here. And we will be off. Now, I was reading an interesting Wall Street Journal article today, everybody. And you know what's, you know what's kind of interesting and quite uplifting, actually? You guys aren't going to believe this statistic, but it's true. So according to the Wall Street Journal, the average net worth of American families reached a record high of $1 million, or I should say, excuse me, uh, 42% of American households are millionaires, which is kind of wild to think about, but it's true. All right, let's uh, head out this way and try to avoid the rain. But I was very surprised to see that because you always hear all about all the negative, but $1 million is the average net worth of American families, a record high up from 42% from $749,000 in 2019. I'll read that again. $1 million is the average net worth of American $149,000 in 2019. But it kind of makes sense, but it also kind of doesn't. I think if you look at the 2019 data, what major event happened between 2019 to now? And I'm going to try to read as many comments as I can, but I got to hold this umbrella. Oh, let me take off the QR code. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, we had all of that fiscal and monetary stimulus, right? After COVID, the Federal Reserve printed so much money, we've kept interest rates pretty much at an all time low. And many people funneled a lot of that money into the stock market and also bought property. Now, we'll see how long this lasts, obviously, since the market is uh, coming under some pressure here. But I see Stephen Bate. I see my friend Sabrina Fair. Life, Liberty, and Guns is that is because of the increases in home equity. I think you're right, Life, Liberty, and Guns. You're probably 100% right at that. Unij23 is here. Hawaii this is ooh, it's raining. I know, and you know what's you know what's so wild, and it's pretty par for the course for New York. New York weather is very bipolar. It's really crazy here. One day could be 80 degrees and sunny, and then the next day could be 40 degrees, but it feels like 20 degrees. It's windy, it's rainy, it's nasty, it's horrible. 
And that's pretty much what we have going on right now. Today was just horrible weather. I thought it was going to be the first full weekend in seven weeks when we didn't have any rain, but we only had one good day, which was yesterday. It was a beautiful, beautiful day. Yesterday was 77 degrees, bright sunshine in Central Park. It was awesome. Uh, but all day today, it was pouring rainy, it was windy, it was nasty. It's just a raw day today. It kind of sucks, but, you know, be it what it may, be it what it may. For those of you who are just tuning in, we are going to be walking all the way down to 34th Street to check out Macy's. I was walking home last night, and they are just starting to put up all of the Christmas lights at Macy's. I think it's way too early for that, but, you know, who am I to say? Hey, touring different places is here. Uh, RB, this is Hey Tom and all. Is the number, is the average or the mean? It is the average. Mark STR, what's up? Cody is here, Razzle Dazzle 786. Good to see you. Hopefully, uh, you're, not, you're not out walking around in this horrible weather. And hopefully, you got a chance to enjoy it yesterday. Travel Neast is here. What is going on? Evan Weeks, thanks for joining us. Now, Evan and team, last week was very busy, extremely, extremely busy. We pretty much every day back to back to back covered in-depth uh, corporate earnings, particularly tech earnings. We've had Meta reporting, which is you know Mark Zuckerberg's company, Facebook. We've had Alphabet, Google, right? We heard from Microsoft, and we've heard from Amazon. Now this week is going to be probably the most anticipated company reporting earnings in the S&P, which is Apple, right? Tim Cook's company is going to be reporting. We'll probably have some preliminary data from the iPhone 15 launch. So I don't know, what are you guys feeling about it? Uh, I think going into the holiday season, I'll give you some anecdotal data, right? And I think it's important to talk about anecdotal data every once in a while, but I guess the following is this. Hey, WM, thank you so much for your $5 donation. I appreciate it very much. Just thank you for braving the weather for us. I appreciate that. Thank you for being here. Now, does anybody remember when the iPhone 15 launched? We were streaming by the Apple Store on Fifth Avenue, right outside the Sherry Netherland Hotel as well as the Plaza Hotel. And it was packed. I've never seen an iPhone launch like that in my entire life. Out of all of my years, I have never seen people lined up stretching around the block all the way to Madison Avenue for this iPhone 15. All of the other iPhone launches, in my eyes, right, visually, like the optics, have really been a dud. I've never seen massive long lines. This was the only, this was the only launch where I've seen people lined up in the city to get the iPhone. So we'll see. Uh, I think the preliminary data from Apple, as it relates to iPhone sales, I think they're gonna come in better than expected. Very, very good. Hey, Evan Weeks. Good to see you. Juan Fernandez is here. Melee says, yes, the new iPhone. Server Group says, no, the original iPhone was huge. Yeah, but that was back in like the dinosaur ages. I'm talking about, you know, recently. You know, the first iPhone, of course, it was unbelievable. But I was like, what, 10 years, six years old? I'm talking about like the recent iPhone releases. Really after the iPhone 6, there's nobody lining up to get an iPhone. At least from my perspective. Would you guys agree with that or disagree? After the iPhone 6 and the iPhone 6S, I've never seen a major line at the Apple Store for the new releases of the iPhones. 
Noah says, did anybody get a new iPhone? Is it worth the upgrade? You know, I still have my iPhone 13 mini. And the only reason why I got the iPhone 13 mini is because I broke the camera on my iPhone 11. This is the Cartier building. It's beautiful right here. Let's uh, continue to head down. JK says we should get a bounce. I think so. Um, you know, if you look at the market, and I, saw, I wrote about this in the newsletter too, you know, the percentage of stocks in the S&P 500, as we're looking at the Versace store right now, that are trading above its 200-day moving average is only about 27% of stocks, which is really crazy. Uh, that means the market is very older, oversold. Uh, breadth of the market has deteriorated quite substantially. And usually, generally speaking, this is when you get some sort of a major relief rally. Um, you know, one of the metrics also that I've been looking at that is not super grossly overextended is the put to call ratio. The put to call ratio is essentially the percentage of people who are betting for the market to go up versus the percentage of people betting against it to go down, right? Uh, if you're buying calls, those are market participants that are making a bullish directional bet, right? Calls are a derivative product in the options market uh, that allow you to control a hundred shares of an underlying stock, right? So essentially, if you buy a call option, you have the right, but not the obligation to purchase 100 shares of an underlying stock at a given date at a certain price, right? And if you buy a put option, essentially what that allows you to do is it gives you the right, but not the obligation to sell 100 shares of an underlying stock at a certain date at a certain price. And one of the things you saw, particularly during the COVID crash, right, the COVID-19 crash, as we're looking at the gorgeous St. Patrick's Cathedral here, is the put-to-call ratio went to Pluto. I mean, the amount of people that were hedging and buying put options was just astronomical. And that usually signals market bottoms, right? You can use it as a little bit of a contrarian indicator. Um, but we're pretty neutral. We're pretty flat in the market right now. There's not a lot of, uh, you know, participants that are getting ex exuberantly bearish, I should say. Hey, SME Media, what's going on? Thank you for joining. Marcy M says, hey, Tom, does Saks Fifth Avenue already have the light show ready to go? So they don't, but I'm a little bit confused by it. So check this out. We are here at Saks Fifth Avenue where they usually have the best holiday lights display ever. I don't think this is part of it. I think this is some Zodiac sign thing. I don't know if it's, I don't, I don't believe it's related to the holidays, but here's something crazy. Radio City Music Hall now has the Christmas tree on top of the sign there. And so does Macy's. Macy's has uh, their holiday lights, which we'll check out today. Check this thing out, guys. Look at that. Dan Zang's like, does anybody remember the Motorola Razors? Didn't they bring that back? I believe Motorola brought that product set back for a bit, I think. This is Rockefeller Center. Since we're here, we might as well quickly check it out. I wonder if people are ice skating in the rain. We'll see. Hey, the 7.9 FH, as they did a couple years ago, and it flopped. Yeah, I don't know who would be buying a Motorola Razor, but we'll see. 
But, you know, anyway, I mean, Apple's going to report earnings this week, and I think we are going to get some very, very good numbers from the iPhone 15. Again, just because anecdotally, I've never seen people lining up like they've lined up for this phone before. Um, I even posted some photos of it on my Twitter. I couldn't believe how many people there were. They went all the way from Fifth Avenue and stretched all the way down near my office on Madison Avenue. It was insane. It was just really, really incredible. Well, speaking of the holidays, the ice skating rink here at Rockefeller Center is officially open. Molly Durant is the ad, so hideous. I just noticed those big L LED signs, I guess. All right, we'll take one quick peek here and then we'll head down to Macy's. But what do you guys think about the ice skating rink? I think it looks pretty good. I think they did a good job this year. It looks beautiful. Carol Browns as well, they have the skating rink open already. I think it opened earlier last week. So yeah, it's been up for a while. Obviously there's not a lot of people using it right now, but. I think the rain just stopped, but it's like a little bit of a misty rain. That's sort of, uh, that's like my least favorite type of rain. When it's not raining hard, but it's like a mist. There's really nothing you could do about the mist. The umbrella really doesn't do anything. So, Hey, Chinook Winds, good to see you. Yeah, all these little houses are sort of going to be like a Christmas village overlooking the ice skating rink, which is going to be really nice. Hey, type username, yes, visited last week when it first opened, very nice. Still working on building the one at Bryant Park. Let's check it out. If we can get to Bryant Park before it closes, we'll check it out, but we'll see. Now, I'm interested in checking out this sculpture here, everybody. You guys see this? What is this? It looks like uh, flowers or something. All right, let's investigate what this is. This actually looks pretty nice. Looks like a pretty nice flower display. Hey, Lee says there was a growing movement among Gen Z to do away with smartphones and revert back to less smart phones like the flip phones. Uh, if that was true, I would actually be very happy about that. Now, did you guys see the data that ACT scores are at some of their lowest levels ever in the United States now. And they're saying it has to do with a very big correlation with TikTok and younger kids, you know, watching these mind numbing, you know, useless videos on short form content like TikTok. Did anybody else see that? Uh, very, very concerning. And some people were saying it's because of overuse of smartphones. But, you know, ACT scores in America, I think, hit their all-time record high in 2013. So, people had smartphones in 2013. I really believe it's due to the short-form content that's consumed. And also, I think it's due to COVID, right, the coronavirus. Because let's face it, right, if we're honest with ourselves, you know, I'll just tell you, a little, I won't put words in anybody else's mouth, I'll just tell you my experience. I was never the best student right in high school at all, okay? Like at all. And I could tell you with 100% certainty that if I was in high school when the big C was going on and I had to do the classes online, I really don't know if I would have been able to finish high school. You know, just thinking back to my personality and sort of how I was when I was in high school, if I wasn't forced to go into school and, and complete it, I would have been totally lost. 
because I was the type of kid who couldn't even concentrate when I was in the classroom, okay? I mean, my mind was buzzing and racing when I was in the classroom with the teacher. If I had to sit on a Zoom call, no shot, pal. I, there's no shot that I'm graduating. And I'm just being honest. So I, I really do believe that a lot of this remote learning, particularly younger people, right? I think it's a little bit more manageable to do in college because when you're in college, you're a little bit more mature. But if you're in eighth, ninth, or 10th grade, you're immature. At least I was, right? So I think that has a big part of it. I think really that does a really, really big disservice to our students. Hey, Trax 101 here says they vetoed our regents at the end of the year because of Corona and we all graduated and passed. Oh my God. So you didn't even have to take the regents exams. I did not know that. Crazy. Really, really crazy. Now that brings me back to high school. For those of you who don't know, a regents exam is the New York State exam. So if you went to high school in New York, which I'm assuming a lot of you did, right? This is a New York live stream. You would have to study, 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 study for the state exam. And I remember taking those, uh, the earth science regents, you know, algebra two and trig, all that stuff. But I don't know, that's just sort of my take on it. And I think it's an important topic of conversation because if you think about all of the new emerging technologies that are going to propel the growth of the U.S. economy over the next five to 10 years, I really do believe it's going to be cloud computing, machine learning, autonomous driving, and these are very STEM intensive fields, right? That we need that top talent, engineering and the like. And as these test scores continue to plummet, it's very concerning for me. So I don't know, do you guys feel the same way that it could be due to, you know, this two years of essentially not having any education in the country? I don't know. Sabrina Ferris, did Tom just say trig? Oh, the memories, I know. It was horrible. Evan Weeks, as I say this as a professional uh, whose livelihoods depends on the internet. Let me read your comment. Hey, Alfred, what's up? Good to see you. Mariana, Texas. What's up? You guys can see the Christmas tree on top of Radio City Music Hall right now. They don't have it lit up, but it is completely built. LA007 says absolutely was concerned when the sea started. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we just need to be honest, right? Because there was a lot of people who said, oh, the, you know, remote schooling is great because the high school kids, you know, are just, they could do it on their own time. Now, at the time of the big C, I was working in tech, right? And I was actually working on some of the major, major um, contracts with a lot of these municipalities and school districts, particularly in New Jersey. Uh, they would purchase hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of Chromebooks with LTE connection. And I actually facilitated some of those deals because what a lot of people don't know, okay, and I think what a lot of middle class and wealthy Americans forget is that there is a major, okay, there is a major portion of the population in inner cities, particularly in New York, uh, in and around you know, Union County, New Jersey, things like that, where these kids do not have internet access at home. I'll say that again. There's many kids who do not have internet connection at home. So when everybody else is doing their work remotely, right, sitting in their room doing it, you have to sort of think about some of the other kids that aren't as privileged, for lack of a better term, word, uh, to be able to have a laptop at home and have an internet connection at home. It just didn't happen. So a lot of these schools had to provide those tools and resources to those students, right, in the form of Chromebooks, laptops, and the like, with connected LTE. And it didn't really work so well, right? It didn't really work so well. 
uh, for many, many various reasons. There's also uh, a decent size, believe it or not, homeless population uh, that these kids don't have physical homes to go back to. They're constantly in and out of shelters. They're going to friends' houses, grandparents' houses. So it was a disaster, this remote schooling thing. And the only thing it did was unfortunately increase the bifurcation of the education stance in America, where the poor and underprivileged kids got, fell further and further behind when everybody else started to exceed and exceed and exceed. And this is another thing that exacerbates the wealth gap and the wealth divide in America. So I think the big C in COVID, shutting down the schools, was the worst thing you could have done for the future of the economy. And a lot of people don't see that, um, but I sort of got a, a behind the scenes look at it because at the time I was working with some big uh, SLED teams, right, which stands for state, local government, public education. And when they flipped the switch and went remote, they're like, oh my gosh, we have a portion of our student population that don't have internet connection at home. So they're gonna fall way behind. So it was a really, really bad, bad situation for sure. And I think that's why you're seeing the correlation with declining SAT and ACT scores here. This is the Barclays Investment Bank. It is a British bank. This used to be the old Lehman Brothers as we head closer and closer to Times Square. Go for Hokies is Tom. I believe that the big C definitely widened the gap. I agree, that's something that the country's gonna need to work on. All right, welcome to a very rainy and stormy Times Square, everybody. Let me catch up on some of the comments. Hey, Elizabeth Gill, what's up? Dan Zhang says, the attention span of the kids probably plummeted significantly during those years as well. Hey, Kristen S. is, or we asked the parents to bring them to campus parking lot and use the Wi-Fi. That's insane. That's crazy. Evan Weeks says, my kids lost all motivation to actually push through the material. And we've been in the last year or so trying to restore that. Oh, I totally, I totally have sympathy for that, 100%. Like again, I'll be transparent and say it. Um, there is no way Right, and I actually, um, I was actually telling this to my mom the other day. I said, you know what? Because again, I was very, very, it's not that I was a stupid person in high school. It's just my, I was just wanted to go on to the next thing. If I found something boring, I couldn't focus on it. I'm like, boom, on to the next thing. And I was like, you know what? I really don't believe I would have graduated high school if, I was in, you know, a year or two before graduating, the big C hit, and I had to do all the work in school. There was no way I would have pushed through and done all the work. I would have totally just blown it off. And, you know, I'd like to see some statistics on the high school dropout rate uh, when COVID happened. We got some data on the college dropout rate, and a lot of people dropped out of college and they didn't go to college during COVID. Um, so I think it's a big problem. And I think that will have impacts on not only the economy down the line, but you know, competitiveness, American competitiveness. Uh, the 79FH, the same terrible attention span, but 80s or 90s, yeah, for sure. Hey, what's up? Western Mass Dave is here. Hey, Dave. Uh, Kristen S. says, hey, Tom, graduation rates didn't suffer as much as you think. They just made it easier to graduate. Interesting. That's a really interesting way to think about it. They just made it easier to graduate. So like they pushed the kids ahead, I guess, in a sense. Interesting. All right, now we are on the northernmost side of Times Square, looking downtown. If you guys are enjoying the live stream so far tonight on this frigid day in Manhattan, feel free to leave a like on the video. 
and click the subscribe button if you're new. We do these live streams almost every day, starting at 8.30. Hey, Ibrahim Zab, what's up? Good to see you, Ibrahim. Hopefully the weather's a little bit better where you are in California. All right, let me see if I could put the umbrella away. Let's check. I think it's still a little misty, but. Now here's another interesting statistic that I was reading this week in the Wall Street Journal. As we know, there was a, essentially an agreement made between the auto workers of America, right? Uh, and all the auto OEMs. Now the top pay per hour is now $40 an hour under the new UAW Pact with Ford that raises wages 25% over the next four and a half years. Now ask yourself, do you think that's gonna keep up with inflation? It'll probably just get you there, right? If you calculate inflation in your personal inflation rate, not look at the CPI number. Um, but secondly, Here's another interesting statistic, 52%. That's how much higher home mortgage payments on average are to apartment rents, the widest since 1996. And I believe that, you know, with all the data that we've been talking about, National Association of Realtors, existing home sales declining uh, and interest rates continuing to rise, uh, many Americans across the country, right, if you run your personal calculator, it's cheaper and more affordable for you to rent now than it is to buy, right? Just run a basic calculator. If you're looking at a $450,000 home and you could put 20% down on that house and you have to leverage out the rest, well, 80% of that debt is now gonna run you 8%. So, you know, in comparison to in 2021, when everybody was paying 3% on their debt, now everybody needs to pay 8%. So your monthly payment is now gonna be almost double in just the interest alone. That's not even including the higher taxes, right? We talked about the high property taxes and the insurance, right? The homeowner's insurance has gone absolutely bonkers, particularly if you live in Florida, if you live in California and parts of New York. You know, I was talking to one of my friends who lives in Brooklyn and due to all the flooding that's been going on over there, his homeowner's insurance went up 20% over year over year. So factor that into your own personal inflation rate. You know, I, get, I bet a lot of people in the United States weren't expecting their homeowner's insurance to go up 20% in a single year. It's uh, really, really wild. So we'll watch this trend, right? My bet or my viewpoint, I gotta put you guys down here for a second is that I think we're gonna see prices continue to cool. And over the next, let's say, six to 10 months in select markets, you're gonna see significant softening in the prices of homes, which I think is a good thing, right? Prices can't just go up all the time gangbusters. Uh, if you want a robust and healthy middle-class economy in the United States, well, guess what? If you look at some of the data and you look at some of the statistics, about, I know Colton Manning is like 40% in two years, it's wild, it is. Uh, if you look at some of the statistics, the first generation millionaires in this country, meaning that they didn't inherit their wealth, they didn't you know, get money from mommy or daddy or get it in a trust, Americans who actually built wealth themselves, right, or built wealth themselves, um, and that did, it them, that did it themselves, didn't get any money inherited, the vast majority of their net worth is made up in equity in their home, right? So if we have an environment where millennials and Gen Z individuals cannot afford to buy a home, well, how are they gonna build wealth? It's gonna be impossible. So this is a very, very sticky situation we have on our hands, and I think the only way it's gonna be solved is for the Federal Reserve to continue to be steadfast 
in allowing interest rates to go up to put a, essentially to force prices to go down. So for first time home buyers, maybe over the next eight to 12 months, I think you're gonna get an opportunity here to have prices soften, to have valuations soften, so then you could enter the market. I mean, that's the, that's the only way that you know, lower and middle class Americans are gonna be able to build wealth and catch up, is if they are allowed easy access into home ownership and real estate ownership to build wealth, uh, which is almost nearly impossible right now, because valuations have not gone down generally speaking they are softening a little bit but the price or the cost of money has gone up significantly um, here let's cross here now talking about you know short attention spans whenever I walk in Times Square that's exactly what I think about because you have you know thousands and thousands of advertisements you know, competing for your attention. You have the rickshaw guys, you have these guys with the spinny things, you have people taking pictures. It's like, uh, it's like an organized chaos in this environment. It's, it's really nuts. Um, kind of crazy. So these are the famous red steps. They do close them when it rains because it is extremely, extremely slippery there. Hey, Roz999 says, by the time you are 25, you will be right up to speed anyway. I have multiple friends that are very successful now, and we are not good high school students. Yeah, more power to you, my friend. That's awesome. Hey, Gail Arnold says, hey, Tom, can you separate the land value from the building value and take out two separate loans for different time frames? 10 year on the land and 20 year on the building, any benefit that way? Um, I would probably ask uh, a real estate attorney, depending on which municipality you live in. That's what I would say. Now, what some people have been doing, and I'm actually working on a, well, I don't want to talk my own book. Well, I'll say this. Something that can be very lucrative, if done correctly, is the following. If you can successfully rezone uh, a particular plot of land or a property, you can then sell that for significantly higher amounts of money. So in some certain neighborhoods of Miami right now, there's single family homes that are selling for you know, $400,000 a pop, right? But the land, that they are on, if they can be converted to or rezoned for commercial uh, or multifamily use, well, guess what? If you accumulate two, three, four single family homes in Miami or anywhere, right? I'm just using Miami as an example. And you can combine those lots, right? So let's say if you own four single family homes right next to each other, you can go to the city, you can combine the lots and then make your case to rezone that plottage of land for developers to build multifamily. You tear down the houses and then you market that land to multifamily developers and they where they can build you know 50 to 100 units on. They actually just did this in a neighborhood very close to me and they used land from an old college. It was an old dental school and they did this and they flipped the land value for like 17 million dollars. And I think it'd be a relatively uh, persuasive sale for the following reasons, right? And again, this is, it's not as, I'm making it sound so much easier than it is, but for the sake of doing a live stream. But anyway, the point I was trying to make is things like that are increasingly becoming a better and better sale to the government, right? To approve that rezone for the following reasons. In major states and major cities like New York and in Florida, Miami, Florida, things like that, we have a housing crisis. We have a ma massive, massive housing crisis where we have no inventory. We have rents of you know, one bed bedrooms and studio apartments in both New York City and Miami hitting all time record highs continuously. 
So if you can go to your local city or your municipality and say, hey, I own you know, five single family houses uh, and the plots are back to back to back right next to each other. What I wanna do is I want to combine those plots, tear down the single family housing and sell it to a developer that's gonna build 75 units I think this is going to be a very good service to you know, the city of North Miami Beach because it's going to bring more inventory to market, it's going to build more housing, and you're probably going to get a deal done that way. So again, super oversimplification, but that could potentially turn you know, a $6 million investment accumulating those particular properties. If done successfully, that could be like a, you know, a $15, $20 million exit. And people have done that before, but it's, it's easier said than done. Easier said than done. So this is where they have all of the Broadway shows. Actually kind of looks quite nice now that it's not super crowded here. They have Hamilton's going on here. I think the Lion King maybe in a block or two. Hey, RPT says, happy soggy Sunday, Tom. Just arrived in Nassau, New York. It is very cold and wet. I know, what a difference a day makes. What a difference a day makes. It's uh, extremely nasty here. Natasha P says, you have zoning laws. It is very hard to do. Yes, it is very, very hard to do. And it's essentially you plead your case and it has to be for the betterment of the community, it, generally speaking. So in today's environment, right, if you can go to your municipality and say, hey, I'm going to you know, sell this to a developer that will commit to having 50% of the inventory being affordable housing, you could probably get that deal done. Uh, but again, it's very laborious and it is very, very hard to do. And that's why real, the real estate business, particularly if you're a developer, is a very capital intensive business uh, and it is very risky. But the payoffs could be huge. some of the, I shouldn't say some of the best restaurants, but a lot of well-known restaurants are right here, up and down this block here. But if you like a lot of the conversations that we have on the stream about residential real estate, about commercial real estate, uh, equities, if you scan the QR code and punch in your email, you'll be signed up to receive all of our free research every other Thursday when the market closes. So I write the Behind the Street newsletter and every other Thursday after the market closes, if you punch in your email, you'll be signed up to receive it. I usually send it out around six o'clock. So if you have not received that yet, go check your email. And I have just added a audio version to the newsletter. So you don't even have to read it now. You could actually just listen to the audio version that is narrated by myself. So if you'd like to receive all of our equity research every other Thursday when the market closes, go ahead and scan the QR code on your screen or type exclamation points news, N-E-W-S in the chat and punch in your email and you'll be signed up to receive it for free. This is an amazing building right here. Hopefully they never tear these down. These are the last three holdouts on the block. As you can see, they've pretty much torn all of the other original buildings down in the block and built these unbelievably super tall, luxurious apartments, which I kind of have mixed feelings about because some of the older New York buildings are just so beautiful and so classy that it's kind of sad to watch them be torn down. I just think the architectural integrity of these are really beautiful. So, I don't know, it's kind of bittersweet, I guess. Hey, Jean Paul says, Florida just passed a housing law 
where developers can bypass zoning laws. Interesting. I think I may need to put the umbrella back on, guys. I think I may need to put it back up. You know what? I don't know. Spencer's like, what is that building that's changing color? I think it's a new hotel. Maybe it was built by a related group. I'm not 100% sure, but let's check it out. <clears throat> I think that's a new hotel and residences, I believe. All right, let me take the QR code down. But for those who can't scan the QR code, if you just type exclamation points news, N-E-W-S in the chat, uh, just click the link that the Nightbot drops and you could uh, sign up for free. Hey, Ibrahim, says Tom, I haven't received the Behind the Street newsletter since February. Uh, it probably went to your spam. So we've, we had to migrate to Substack because our good friend Elon Musk shut down review. He shut down the whole company. And that is where our newsletter was stationed, at review. So uh, Elon Musk nuked that company. And then we had to find another company to send out the email. So I decided on Substack. Substack is very good. And it also allows me to record podcasts. So check your spam or you could just sign up again by clicking the link in the description. Hey, Rocky Raccoon, what's up? It's good to see you. Yeah, it should be the HTTPS walks Wall Street substack dot inflation. That is the... Uh, that's our latest post. So Thursday, this past Thursday, I wrote a piece and that is it. You can listen to it or you can uh, read it. Oh, cool, Roz999 says, Tom, thanks so much for broadcasting. I work for a bank headquartered in downtown. Uh, wow. Yeah, I mean, hopefully you can get back here soon. Wow, you haven't been here since the, the ban. I'm assuming that means the big C. Now this is another big problem that the city is trying to combat. You have all of these uh, mopeds with the guy giving me the middle finger. And uh, the city is essentially trying to repo them. and uh, sort of get them out of here because a lot of them are illegal with no uh, license plate. So a lot of the city is uh, a little bit upset about it. Hey guys. DC322 says they don't like being filmed. Uh, I don't care. Don't care. All right, let's go all the way down to 34th Street and you'll be able to see all of the Christmas lights that are up already at Macy's. Which I kind of can't believe because it's not even Halloween yet. It seems like every single year uh, capitalism pushes the holiday season, particularly Christmas, closer and closer and closer um, to before Halloween which is quite wild. Okay. <laughs> to the right, you'll see the Port Authority bus terminal. Now, I've heard some news. The building right next to the McDonald's is going to be demolished, and that is also going to be condominiums. Let's actually check out the site. Because I remember there used to be a Dunkin' Donuts in that building. It was a very old, pre-war style building. Uh, but I believe, according to the real deal, which is like a real estate publication, it was just purchased and they're gonna tear it down and build more condominiums. So I guess it's good news for the supply coming onto the market, but if I had to make a bet, 
And again, I don't know 100%, but I've had to make a bet. It's probably going to be luxury condos, so it may not be the best to uh, you know, solve the affordability crisis, but you, know, you get what you get, I guess. Hey, Jeff in Southern Tier, New York. Uh, says, do you think they're just taking advantage of the... Oh, I don't know. I'm not really too sure. Kristen S. says, how cold is it in New York City in January? It's very cold. Now, some people like the cold. Uh, I don't personally. And it also depends on where you are in the city. If you're in Lower Manhattan, downtown on Wall Street, or Water Street, or near the South Street Seaport, it's going to feel a lot colder than if you were in Midtown Manhattan, right? Where we are right now. It just depends. Usually, the closer to the water you are, the colder it is, right? Because the wind picks up and that feels really, really brutal. But, you know, New York weather is weird. New York is extremely bipolar with the weather. It's not uncommon that every now and then we'll get a 55 degree day, a 60 degree day in January. It does happen, it doesn't, have an, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. I mean, just look what happened yesterday. We had 77 degrees. Oh, this is the, uh, this is the building, we'll check it out. Yeah, this was uh, Dunkin' Donuts. And now this is gonna be luxury condos. I mean, I don't know who would buy a luxury condominium right across the street from the Port Authority bus terminal, right? I mean, I'm just being honest with you guys. I mean, I sell luxury real estate in New York City, and you know, I have a fiduciary duty to my clients. Uh, if some of my clients were interested in purchasing a luxury condominium right across the street from the Port Authority bus terminal, I'd say uh, no. And if they wanted to go through with the purchase, I would refer them to a different real estate agent because they are not going to be pleased with their purchase living right across the street from Port Authority, let me tell you that. But particularly with the, different, with the particular environment we are in right now. But yeah, you know, a lot of the buildings on the block used to look just like that. These old pre-war style buildings here. Crazy. Now the city has done a really good job with Penn Station. Pennsylvania Station looks fantastic now. They've done a really, really good job. I think they need to start to do the same exact thing with the Port Authority Terminal. Hey JF, what's up? Yeah, the resales would be brutal, particularly, you know, I'll let you guys in on a little secret, okay? There's a lot, well, I shouldn't say a lot. There are some international buyers that come to New York City, right, to sometimes, you know, make an investment in park cash, but they don't necessarily know all the nooks and crannies in the particular streets in New York City, right? So they'll see an apartment and it'll be really, really beautiful, and they don't really know that the Port Authority bus terminal is like the worst particular location in the United States. Uh, I'm being a little bit facetious there, but you get what I mean. And they buy these brand new developments and these subpar locations, and then when they wanna to go to resell, it's very difficult because the vast majority of resales are captured by New Yorkers. And I don't think any New Yorker that's born and raised here is gonna say, oh, you know what my dream is? My dream is to live right next to the Port Authority bus terminal. Yeah, that's what I, where I'm gonna spend $2 million. I just don't see that. So it's important to do your diligence on the location. It's very, very important. And you need to go neighborhood by neighborhood, block by block, street by street to figure it out. Um, I don't believe it's good enough anymore just to say, oh, it's uh, the Upper West Side. Oh, it's Tribeca. Oh, it's Soho. No, no, no. The location needs to be what block is it on, what street corner is it on, to the precise location. Uh, and if you don't know that, you could make a, a potential bad purchase. You've got to know uh, exactly where you're buying. It may sound obvious, but you'd be surprised. You'd be very, very surprised.
Ricardo says, is Queens a good place to live? Yeah, but again, it, see, that's exactly the thing that I was sort of alluding to, right? People will say, oh, Queens is great. Well, Queens is absolutely massive, okay? Queens is a huge, huge borough. You know, Manhattan is a huge, huge borough. So some people are, will say, oh, is Manhattan a good place to purchase? Well, are you purchasing? Well, Manhattan includes Billionaire's Row on 57th Street, and it also includes some very unfavorable neighborhoods. So it, uh, it all depends on the neighborhood. That's what I'll say. But the borough of Queens is great. I like Queens, but there are some locations where I would never uh, particularly purchase. So you have to know. All right, we are approaching the New Yorker Hotel here in a minute, folks. Yeah, Chris says Long Island City looks like a really good place to live. Long Island City has changed so much. Uh, if you want some of the best views of Manhattan, they can be seen from Long Island City. There's tons of new developments going up there, ultra luxury condos. I think if our moderator is still in the chat, Dan Sang, uh, he had a really nice place in Long Island City. Uh, he's lived there for many years. And that is a really nice place to live. Unfortunately, as it's gotten nicer, well, guess what? It's also gotten much, much more expensive. There's parts of Long Island City that are more expensive than some parts of Manhattan in terms of a price per square foot. So Long Island City has changed a lot for the better. It's really, really, really nice there. Uh, Cody says, what's the best borough, Tom? Well, this is going to get me in trouble. This is going to get me in trouble, but I like Manhattan. I think Manhattan is the best borough. I think it's indisputable. Uh, it's so iconic. You have Wall Street, you have Park Avenue, you have Grand Central Station, you have all of the amazing museums here. Museum of Natural History, the Guggenheim Museum, uh, the Met, the Henry Clay Frick Collection. You have the Morgan Library, you have the Stephen Schwartzman building. I mean, I could go on and on and on about all of the amazing things that Manhattan has to offer. Uh, so I, I would say Manhattan is the best borough. I don't know, I'll ask the chat. What do you guys think? If you had to say, you know, if someone came to you, what's the best borough? And you had to live there though, right? So for living, for work, for play, all of that, what would you say? What do you think the best borough is? I'm sticking with Manhattan. I think Manhattan is by far the best. Abyss says I love downtown Brooklyn. Ooh, downtown Brooklyn is, is kind of nice. I like Dumbo Brooklyn a little bit better though. Uh, Group says yes, Manhattan hands down is the best. Life, Liberty, and Guns is Manhattan. Ooh, Niles. This is Brooklyn. Okay, I respect it. DM says Manhattan, Emmanuel says the Bronx. Bronx is a great borough too. Dan Sang says, I will say it totally depends on your lifestyle, so I will never live in Manhattan. Ah, because you like driving. That's a really good point actually. Dan Sang makes a freaking fantastic point. We'll talk about that in a minute. Noah says, what's your favorite neighborhood to live in? Central Park South and the Upper West Side. I'd say those two. Western Mass Dave's is Outer Boroughs, but close Manhattan. NMB045 says, I like the Red Hook stream. Yeah, that area is really nice, but to Dan Sang's point, if you live in Red Hook, Brooklyn, you need a car. Like, you really, really need a car. The closest subway station to Red Hook, Brooklyn, I believe, is Smith Street. And that's about a 15 minute walk. And that's when the weather is great. So imagine if it's pouring, raining, or snowing. It's probably gonna take you 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, Zen says, sorry y'all, once a Florida boy, always a Florida boy. Well, technically I'm a Florida guy too, right? 
I bought a place in Miami. I love Florida. State of Florida is amazing. Ah, SoCal Lawrence is the Lower East Side. Lower East Side is fantastic. Agreed. So I think the chat is overwhelmingly says Manhattan is the best borough. We've had a couple Brooklyn. I don't think we've had any Queens. Did anybody answer Queens? Hey, Jennifer, this is Brooklyn here. What's up? I did enjoy my time living in Brooklyn for a short time. I lived in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. It was some of the most fun times I've had in my adult life living on my own have been in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. That is what I will say. Dan Sanks says, I will always say Queens. Queens has good food. Queens is very good food. Edward Adams says, Tom, Long Island City is up and coming. Uh, now is the time to get in there. Well, Long Island City now is trading at top tick pricing, like really, really expensive pricing. You know, on in terms of price per square foot, you can have Long Island City. Oh, hey, what's up, man? Where'd you go? Good to see you. Really cool. Yeah, they're good. Yeah, some of the uh, price per square foot in Long Island City is uh, almost more expensive than some of the neighborhoods in Manhattan. And the condos that are going up are nuts. They have swimming pools, they have a ton of just amazing amenities. This is the New Yorker Hotel here. Ah, Chris says, I'm a country boy. I wouldn't live there to save my life. Yeah, some people just like to come to visit. I get that, I respect it. I respect it. Now, I would live in the country. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind that. But I couldn't do it all the time, though. Uh, I consider, like, I'll put it to you this way. Where I live in Miami, Florida, I consider that the country. When I go back to my house in Miami, I feel at peace, I feel like it's in the country, I feel like it's away from everybody. But if I were to, you know, tell that to somebody who's from, you know, Wyoming, they'd be like, dude, Miami is not the country. And I get that, but the neighborhood where I live in, it's not like you see here. It's like a rural neighborhood. It's not a big city. Even though I technically live in a big city, it's not. Hopefully I'm explaining that. Hopefully I'm not explaining that correctly, but. but yeah, some people like to be away. They like to be all the way out in the country, and I and I get that, but there's nothing like waking up on a Sunday morning, rolling out of bed and walking two blocks to a coffee shop. I don't have to get in the car, I don't have to, you know, get ready or prepared. I just walk the city. It's the most walkable city in the world. Coffee shops, restaurants, anything you want is within walking distance. And that's why I love Manhattan so much. I think that's what I love the most about New York City is if you come here with nothing, like no belongings, you're actually at an advantage. Because as Dan said, dealing with a car, dealing with all your belongings in New York City, it's a pain. It's a real, real big pain. So. I'd say the convenience and close proximity of restaurants, coffee shops, is what I love most about the city. Hey, hey Kevin Grant from London is here. Hey, Kevin. This is Tom. Uh, it's still raining heavy here in London. It's been like this day and night for days. Now, it's raining like crazy here in the city too, but we did have one day of nice weather, so. Hawaii says, yes, I love to walk and explore New York City. It's a huge adult playground, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's another thing. If you come to New York as a tourist, like, all you do is you could just have a whole day of it just walking around aimlessly, and you'll run into so many amazing things. Uh, you can't really say that about any other city. Now, Miami, is it walkable? Kind of. Kind of. This is the Empire State Building here. but. Miami is not as walkable as New York City. You need a little Vespa to get around or you need a car to get around. 
because if you walk around Brickell, is it beautiful? Yes, absolutely beautiful. It's one of my favorite spots in the entire world, right there downtown Miami and Brickell, but it's not as expansive and it's not as vast as Manhattan. You know, you could spend the entire day aimlessly rolling, roaming the streets of Manhattan and, you know, it's going to take you years to explore every nook and cranny. Um, that is a big plus. So we've now reached Madison Square Garden. We are on the southernmost side of MSG. You can see all the taxi cabs lined up here. And then to the right, you have the brand new Moynihan train hall. Dan Sanx of Thompson's story is right next to Long Island City. Its rent price has also gone up significantly. I could imagine. Dan says he thinks his story is going to be the next uh, neighborhood to have all of those major luxury condos. Probably, probably. Um, you know, who in a million years would have ever thought in downtown Brooklyn, you'd have one of the most expensive luxury condos ever. Is it me or did they put more scaffolding at MSG? It seems like all of this scaffolding is relatively new. I think they did. Tons of taxi cabs out tonight. Like a lot. This is a good shot of the Moynihan train hall. Looks like a lot of people are coming back to the city from the weekend. All right, let's... I'll show you guys the brand new pen project, or the two pen. Alright, but if you guys are enjoying the live stream so far tonight, feel free to click the like button and subscribe to the channel if you are new. We usually do these live streams every night at 8.30, so if you'd like to join us, click the subscribe button and uh, join us here every night. This is Billy Joel, one of my favorite people on the planet. He says, Madison Square Garden is the center of the universe as far as I'm concerned, and I would agree with that. It just needs a little bit of uh, tender, loving care, Madison Square Garden. And the good news is it's getting it. We have the Penn Project coming up, which is going to be a brand new Penn Station and a lot of the office and retail around the neighborhood is going to be completely ripped and replaced. You'll see a lot of the scaffolding coming up here as well. But to sort of get back on track here, everybody, I think we had a really good conversation about real estate in Manhattan uh, and in the outer boroughs. But next week is going to be a very, very busy week on Wall Street. Obviously, last week we had the vast majority of major tech companies reporting earnings. We heard from Microsoft, we heard from Alphabet, we heard from Amazon, and now we are going to hear from the largest company in the S&P 500. We are going to hear from Apple, and they are going to report next week, the day after the Federal Reserve and Fed Chairman Jerome Powell conclude their FOMC meeting. So to review, the current Fed funds rate in the United States sits at five and a quarter and five and a half percent. If you look at the bond market 
consensus pretty much says that we are not going to get an interest rate hike on Wednesday, right? November 1st. It's kind of hard to believe that Wednesday is November 1st, but it's true. That is when the Federal Reserve is going to update monetary policy. It's consensus that we are going to hold right at five and a quarter to five and a half percent. But if I had to bet, I think we are going to get a rate hike in December, bringing the Fed funds rate for the end of the year to five and a half to five and three quarters of a percent. Now, if that happens, my prediction is that the 10 year US Treasury yield is going to be over 5% and the 30-year fixed rate mortgage will be knocking on the door of 9%. Now remember, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage in the United States right now, the average, is going for 8%. And this is because earlier last week, for a very, very brief period of time, the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield eclipsed 5%. Now, we have had a little bit of buying in the bond market, so yields have come down quite substantially, but I don't think this interest rate hiking cycle is over, and I think you're going to continue to see a little bit of sell-off in the bond market here. So it's very important that we pay attention to this going into next week. Obviously, on the day of the FOMC meeting, we are going to be doing an in-depth live stream breaking down exactly what the Fed chair has said. Now, if you turn your attention here, this is the brand new Pen2 project. And you can see this really cool electronic screen here. This is all brand new. And look at that. There's pumpkins rolling around. That's very, very unique to have. Very festive for Halloween. I'm curious to see what they're going to do for Christmas. But so far, it looks pretty good. We just need to get all the scaffolding down, and then it'll look a little bit better. Hey, Melissa2087 is here. What's up? Hey, Mars Tech. Dude, long time no see. It's good to see you. Hopefully, you're doing well, and I trust you had a fantastic weekend. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Diane, this is Tom. 60 Minutes tonight touched on the commercial vacancy in New York City. Upgrades to HVAC systems are where those buildings are investing money to improve air quality. Wow, I didn't know that. That's cool that they touched on it. That's so funny because, guys, that's what we've been talking about for the past year, right? Uh, we've been talking about how vacancy rates in New York City, particularly commercial office, have been rising, right? And I guess now it's just hitting mainstream media. Whenever you see something on 60 Minutes, I'll just say this, and I'm not trying to be mean to the, the media, but usually 60 Minutes is like the mainstream, like where everybody, you know, sees it that really aren't paying attention to the granular every day in and out to the business. That is usually right where you have a major pivotal moment and the market completely turns and does a 180, which actually makes sense, right? Because we're starting to see some of these bankruptcies here and a lot of these big commercial, uh, players and operators go into foreclosure. I think that's going to create some big opportunities. So interesting. I'll have to check that out when I get home. But yeah, this has been a, this has been a massive, massive trend. This is the vacant space of the old Hotel Pennsylvania, I believe it was called. It's still really surprising to watch just a massive vacant lot here. And it makes way for a beautiful view of the Empire State Building. If you've been to uh, New York City before and you haven't been over here, come check it out because it is very strange looking to see a massive open space in an open lot right in front of Penn Station. And they have these two ridiculous looking advertising signs right here. Look at that. It's an amazing shot of the Empire State Building. Now, in the research piece, this is opening in the fall of 2023. That's right now. 
Since we have a lot of new people here, I will take you guys down into the underworld to experience just what it's like for Long Island Railroad and subway commuters to commute in the new, brand new Penn Station. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, we've been down there before. It looks completely different. They've raised the ceiling heights quite substantially. And this is exactly what we need because oftentimes when people first arrive to New York City, Penn Station is what they see. So uh, before, it <laughs> definitely wasn't the best first impression. But now I think that first impression will be one to last as, um, you know, it, it actually looks nice for once. But, you know, to talk, to touch on the commercial real estate, uh, in the newsletter that I sent out to everybody on Thursday, this last Thursday, I wrote a little bit of a piece sort of talking about all of the commercial real estate debt that is going to need to be rolled over, right, at significantly higher interest rates. And it's quite stunning uh, just to see how the stars are aligning here. This is the brand new entrance to Penn Station. Essentially what they did is they blew a big hole in the ceiling and they built this really incredible kind of like waterfall-esque uh, escalators going down into the main concourse. Now obviously all of this is still encased in scaffolding, but when they remove it, it's going to look quite nice. But again, if you, if you want to check out some of my thoughts on the commercial real estate market, I, I gave you guys all that data. All you have to do is just type exclamation point news, N-E-W-S in the chat, and the Nightbot is going to drop the link to the newsletter, and you'll get it in your email box every other Thursday. So this is going down in the main concourse here, and you'll notice how open it is, how airy it is. It just looks so much better than what it used to look like when I was a kid. Uh, it looked quite horrible, but... What do you guys think? First impressions? I think it looks quite nice. This is the main Long Island Railroad. If you walk a little bit further to the back, you can get to New Jersey Transit and the Amtrak. And it seems like it's pretty busy in here. We won't venture too far down in here because the internet is a little bit spotty. But I think it's good for the viewer who's never been in New York. Maybe you're planning a trip to New York City. Chances are you're going to come through Penn Station. And they have done a fantastic job of remodeling the space. And I think it looks really good. You're going to have all retail storefront here. You have a Dos Toros coming soon. You have a Walgreens. You have a Dunkin' Donuts, a Subway sandwich. And you have the subway all the way in the back where you can get the one, two, and the three trains uptown and downtown, which is really nice. And notice how clean it is. For all of our audience who are either lifelong New Yorkers or who have been to Penn Station before, uh, you'll probably agree with me that this is a much better improvement, if you will. If you look to where it says track 18 and 19, this is how tall the ceilings were throughout the entire station. I know it's extremely hard to believe, but it's true. The ceiling heights, some people, right, if you were seven foot tall, you kind of had to duck your head. It was very claustrophobic down here. It was horrible. Uh, but now they seem to be cleaning it up a little bit, which is great. All right, let's head back up. And notice when we head up the escalator, you'll have an unobstructed view of the Empire State Building. They kind of set it up in a very unique way where as you come up the escalator, the first thing you see when you enter the city is the spire of the Empire, which is really nice. I know Storm Rider says this is not the Penn Station of the 90s. Definitely not. Now, I'm not as... Uh, I was born in 95, so in full transparency, I don't really remember Penn Station in the 1990s, but I do remember Penn Station in the early 2000s, and it just wasn't an inviting terminal, right? And 
Penn Station is one of the most busy terminals in the world, quite literally, in terms of passengers. And I think it deserves to be a lot better and brighter. So, And then boom, you have that nice view of the Empire State Building right as you come down. So for the audience who haven't seen that before, what'd you think? What are the first initial impressions of the new Penn Station? Thumbs up, thumbs down, what do you guys think? I think they're doing a good job so far. I'm interested to see what it's gonna look like when it's fully complete, but I think it looks good. I give them two thumbs up. So, Storm Riders looks so much better now. Sharon's is definitely looks more inviting, which is good for tourists, right? Particularly, you know, one of the things I was thinking about the other day is if you're coming here from yeah. Dubai, if you're coming here from South Korea, Japan, and you arrive to a dirty, dusty, you know, subway station as your first impression in New York, that's probably not going to be a pretty good impression, right? Because the public transportation and the infrastructure in some of those cities and countries are just much better. Right in Japan, you know the subway system in Tokyo is amazing. Uh, in South Korea, Seoul, you know, very clean, very modern. You know, places like Abu Dhabi, Dubai, the UAE, very modern. So, I think the United States, particularly a city like New York, kind of needs to compete with that infrastructure. Now, unfortunately, with us, since we have very old infrastructure, we need to do a complete rip and replace. But. All right, so this is the moment, guys. Look at that. If you look to your left, they're already starting to put up the Christmas decorations at Macy's. Yeah, sir, so that's because they aren't over 100 years old. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, they're newer cities, right? I think that's why I'm so bullish on Miami is because Miami is a newer city, right? Uh, generally speaking, in terms of all like the high rises and the public transportation infrastructure, it's very, very difficult to sort of rip and replace the subway system, which is over hundred years old. You're hundred percent right. I think we're gonna have to put the umbrella back on. Travel needs this is we need to increase uh, the interest rate. So what do you think, Travel needs to? Do you think on Wednesday the Federal Reserve is going to hike interest rates? What do you think? Yes or no? I guess I'll extend that question to everybody else in the chat. So Wednesday is November first, if you could believe it or not, and that means that is the conclusion of the Federal Open Market Committee (FOMC) meeting. Uh, do you guys think the Fed is going to hike interest rates or do you think they're going to leave rates unchanged or do you think they're going to cut? What do you think as we are looking at the uh, Christmas lights here? I'm seeing some yeses, I'm seeing some noes. Austin City Limits is no hikes. JK says the Fed will hike in December. That's what I think. I think we're going to skip this time, and I think the Federal Reserve is going to hike in December. Ah, Storm Rider says, no, I have a home on the market. What location? Where are you selling? Well, hopefully you get the best possible price. The market is softening. The housing market is softening significantly. Wow, someone says you're gonna cut. Brian's is unchanged. I think the Fed should continue to be steadfast and, and tighten a little bit more, I think. 
It's just, here's the thing I don't like, and I'll be very blunt and I'll be very transparent about it. What I don't like is all of these executives at major Wall Street mega banks and even, you know, some hedge fund managers on Wall Street, you know, whining and complaining and pouting that, oh my gosh, the Federal Reserve is going to, they're, they're so stupid, they're going to crash the economy, they're not looking at the appropriate data, and they're complaining and whining and essentially trying to force the Fed to cut and relax monetary conditions. To which I say, follow the money. Follow the money. The reason why they're saying these things is because they have exclusively benefited over the last 12 years of extremely lackadaisical monetary policy. And if you're a big hedge fund manager and an investment banker, right, if you work at an investment bank, uh, the wealthy elite are the ones who have access to all of this cheap liquidity. It's not regular people like me and you, right? Uh, so they love when interest rates are artificially suppressed because they can borrow money in perpetuity to buy back shares of their own stock, accumulate assets, and price everybody else out of the market. So when rates normalize, that exposes some of their schemes in essence, right? And I say that for lack of a better word because Warren Buffett said it best, right? When the tide goes out, you really know who's swimming naked. And all of these major private equity firms, hedge funds, and ultra high net worth investors, they have absolutely gone, I mean, AWOL on binging on cheap money. Now, when interest rates go up, it's going to become very, very difficult for them to service their debts when they come due to be rolled over because they're gonna to have to pay significantly higher interest rates. So my take is we can't live in an environment where the system is rigged for the top 10%, okay? And when you have artificially suppressed interest rates, this forces or it encourages debt acquisition in perpetuity. And as I've said before, who has access to this liquidity? It tends to be major corporations that use that money to buy back shares of their own stock. Uh, it's essentially free money, right? You have massive amounts of liquidity. So when the Fed raises rates, it's sort of like the party's over here. Uh, and they don't like that. Their investments start to go down. You know, the valuations of the real estate they bought start to go down. But as interest rates go up, you know, savers, the average guy or girl, is actually being rewarded again in this economy, right? I'm sure everybody who has money in a bank, right, has seen their interest rates uh, go up significantly. So I'm in favor for capitalism, right? Not corporate socialism, not manufactured modern monetary theory. So I don't like it when select few people on Wall Street are pouting about the Fed we can't live in an environment where we have artificially suppressed interest rates in perpetuity forever. We need to let things normalize. We need to let valuations come down here and we need to build out the middle class. And you're not gonna build out the middle class if you price them out of homes. And if you don't allow them to build wealth through investing in the stock market and through buying property. So that's sort of my take. Uh, but guys, I wanna thank all of you very, very much for joining us on this live stream. If you enjoyed it, feel free to leave a like on the video and click the subscribe button if you're new. If you want to be signed up to receive all of our equity research for free, uh, I publish it every other Thursday after the market closes. Go ahead and scan the QR code on your screen or type exclamation point news, N-E-W-S in the chat and you will receive my latest market update that I emailed everybody on Thursday. And if you punch in your email, you will receive it going forward. So go ahead and do that. But everybody, have a wonderful Monday. I wish you a fantastic week ahead. And I will see you all tomorrow at 8.30. So Sally, I appreciate it. Storm Rider, Noah. Uh, my good friend Carol H. is here. Says, Tom, when are you back in Miami? Pretty soon, hopefully. Pretty, pretty soon, hopefully. So we'll see. Uh, Wendy England, I appreciate it. Uh, but Carol H., thank you for joining us tonight. 
JK, appreciate it. Mars Tech, all of our great moderators, Sharon, Austin City Limits, uh, Michelle McGraw, Colton Manning, Michelle Henry, UniJ23, Western Mass Dave, and Bren Hawthorne. Uh, guys, there's always a bull market somewhere. You just need to know where to look. Happy Monday. Have a great week, and I'll see you all right back here tomorrow live at 8.30 on Walks and Wall Street. Take care, everybody. See you tomorrow.